if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Okay, good to go. Nice and gloomy for a horror show here. Nice and dark with a fire. <laughs> Welcome to Mindshack True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And Maxwell Powers. And we have one of the most notorious, if not the most notorious, most infamous cases today. That of Jack the Ripper. This is part one, Beyond the Infamy. If you like our podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. And check us out on social media, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, Patreon. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit notifications to get updates when we upload new podcasts. So, Maxwell, what do you think of the Jack the Ripper case? Possibly the most famous true crime case in history. We just, yeah. rec- we just recently did OJ, which was the most mm. famous case in modern history. But Jack the Ripper is famous all over the world. Huh. Now oh, I don't I don't know much that much about it, um, and I'm thinking it did it occur in like 1800s or how how far back is that? 1888. Uh, okay, so late. Okay, um, I don't know that much about it, but I think it's um, for some reason I think of London, and I think of the streets there, and uh, also and I think of like street lamps and him, you know, just pulling in women from the streets into the alleys and ripping their guts out with either like some kind of like like butcher knife and laying it out on display for all to see the next morning that's what i that's what i know I, and, and and i think i think the number is run in the hundreds right like 150 or something like that what numbers uh the number of kills uh it's actually only five confirmed or Damn, not actually it. actually i shouldn't say confirmed there's five see jack the ripper has his own canon it actually there's a field of study called ripperology which is the study of jack the ripper and the jack the ripper case and ripperologists are researchers some of which who have spent many decades on this case studying wow. the victims the possible suspects there's over 120 suspects for jack the ripper wow Wow, that's a that's a weird case. That's a oh oh, and that's that's the tip of the iceberg. This is probably the most bizarre case ever in the um, in trying to match up known information with unknown yeah. information, because a lot of these suspects seem to fit the bill, but they couldn't have all done it, or could they? Some people there there's theories abound. There there's probably more conflicting theories in the Jack the Ripper case than any other case. Huh. So this is worse than, uh, like, wow, this is worse than any other serial murder case. Yeah. Would would it it be categorized as serial murder or are there copycats or what? What's going on here? We'll get into that. But just the sheer number of different theories. Some people think he was some kind of lunatic surgeon. Some people think he was a mad or a mad doctor. Some people think he was H.H. Holmes, the American serial killer. Some people think he was just simply... Uh, one of the downtrodden, poverty-stricken drunkards of the Whitechapel area of the East End in London during this time period. There's all sorts of theories out there, and in typical mind shock fashion, we will go down every avenue, or in this case, every alley, exploring huh. every single aspect of this case. All of the victims, there's five main victims. But there's 9 to 11 other victims which may have also been killed by Jack the Ripper. And we'll be getting into a whole bunch of different theories. One of which actually traces Jack the Ripper to New York City after the murder stopped in London. Some people think they stopped because he was killed or imprisoned or ad- admitted to a mental institution. But just I'm going to just read a super quick background of Jack the Ripper. This is from History.com. Just in case people out there have not heard of the case. I'm actually a little bit surprised you have heard of it, Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you haven't heard of Jonestown. so. <laughs> well, well, I think they made – well, I don't know. They made documentaries on it on Discovery Channel, I, and I think I glanced through that like for a little bit and changed the channel. Maybe I don't know. 
Yeah, there's probably yeah, there's probably more books written on Jack the Ripper than any other case. There's dozens and dozens of books by experts and many documentaries as well. So just quick history.com background on Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper terrorized London in 1888, killing at least five women and mutilating their bodies in an unusual manner, indicating that the killer had a substantial knowledge of human anatomy. We're actually going to dispute that as well on Mind Shot, because not all the victims had organs removed and things like that, which, by the way, there was some occult activity. There was some DWB action, Maxwell, in white <laughs> Devil worshipping bastards. Yeah, there's, there's, there's Illuminati conspiracy theories. There's a conspiracy theory involving the royal family huh. and the Jack the Ripper case. Huh. So the culprit was never captured or even identified, and Jack the Ripper remains one of England's and the world's most infamous criminals. All five killings attributed to Jack the Ripper took place within a mile of each other in or near the Whitechapel district of London's East End from August 7th to September 10th, 1888. Several other murders occurring around that time period have also been investigated as the work of Leather Apron. Another nickname given to the murderer. Wait, a number, what, what, wait what was that name? Leather Apron? Is that leather what? Apron, yeah. Huh. A number of letters were allegedly sent by the killer to the London Metropolitan Police Service, also known as Scotland Yard, taunting officers about his gruesome activities and speculating on murders to come. The moniker Jack the Ripper originates from a letter, which may have been a hoax, published at the time of the attacks. Despite countless investigations claiming definitive evidence of the brutal killer's identity, his or her name and motive are still unknown. Various theories about Jack the Ripper's identity have been produced over the past several decades, which include claims accusing the famous Victorian painter Walter Sickert, a Polish migrant, and even the grandson of Queen Victoria. Since 1888, more than 100 suspects have been named, contributing to widespread folklore and ghoulish entertainment surrounding the mystery. So, you know what's absolutely bizarre is the sheer amount of theories on Jack the Ripper, of conflicting theories. We're going to go over all of them, but even with the organ removal in uh, a few of the victims, some people theorize that actually happened after Jack the Ripper killed the victim, uh -huh. and the morgue doctor or someone else actually stole the organs to sell them for research uh -huh. or whatnot, because that was actually being done at the time. Like, people were digging up graves and uh -huh. all of this. This was a bizarre time period with a lot of shadiness involved. Uh -huh. So part of the aim of this podcast is to also dispel a lot of the common myths surrounding Jack the Ripper and, and even the victims. So this case also kind of kick-started the whole newspaper reporting frenzy and sensationalism, which continued to this day. I mean, if you look at the OJ case, I mean, Jack the Ripper was the, the equivalent of the OJ case in 1888. Everybody uh. was talking about Jack the Ripper. It was all over the newspaper. It was just a media frenzy. So uh. it also is probably the most famous, other than the Zodiac killer, it was probably the most famous case where the killer or alleged killer is taunting police with letters this is probably one, oh, of, the, one of the first if not the original definitive case where the killer or supposed killer is taunting the police huh. and also this seems to be the beginning of a kind of a morbid fascination of the public with murder and death that kind uh, of continues to this day with all these yeah. different, not necessarily serial killers, but all these morbid crimes and the newspaper reporting on them. This is pretty much ground zero for all that. Wow. And that you started it all, huh? That Well, one of the first, yeah. There's actually, we'll be getting into a lot of different things in this podcast series, which will probably be one of our longer series because there's just a plethora of information to delve through. But one of the main things I want to talk about in this inaugural episode of the Jack the Ripper series is the humanity of the victims, because people kind of get caught up in all these other things and the mystery of it and who killed it, whose alibi matches up, who does it. By the way, we also have DNA testing done in this case. Oh, sure. uh, almost 100 years later, there's supposedly a DNA match to a suspect, and we got a, 
obviously oh, examine all these suspects in depth. But but That's yeah, let's look at let's look at the background of Whitechapel and the victims. Because the humanity of the victims is lost. I mean, this is a really, really sad case. And also, just real quick, the common theme in Jack the, in the whole Jack the Ripper mythos is that he's killing prostitutes. These women were not prostitutes. So some people think that the police didn't care about him because they were prostitutes, but they actually did a full investigation. And another fun fact, Bram Stoker actually changed the protagonist in his novel Dracula. He changed the protagonist from Scotland Yard detectives to vampire hunters because Scotland Yard couldn't catch Jack the Ripper and they were too incompetent to find the murderer. So that actually influenced Dracula, the quintessential novel on vampires. Isn't that weird? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, the inspector resigned from the whole station because he couldn't solve this case. We'll be doing a dedicated podcast on how the investigation was handled. It was also early in the in the days of forensics, using DNA evidence, using dogs. This is early, early in the field of forensics. So a lot of people think that if the crimes were committed today, Jack the Ripper would be would be caught instantly. There were actually witnesses to some of the crimes as well, which a lot of people think there's no witnesses. There's a description. I mean, the FBI has put out a profile. There's a lot of information to go through in this case. And some people think this is an unsolvable case. And the timeless mystery is the reason people are fascinated with it. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? Uh, About the timeless history? The time with mis- the mystery that it can't be solved if it's an unsolved um, case. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess any mystery, like when it's not solved, it's like people gravitate to it. And I guess the more insane it is, like Jack the Ripper, uh, at least that's what I, my impression is, like the the brutality of the murders, that kind of thing. Like, and there's no like I don't know. It just it just makes it worse. It get it, people gravitate towards that. And not knowing, and not knowing who it is. So I don't know. It's just a mystery. I don't like believe. I don't mysteries. believe anything is impossible. I think it is solvable. The the sheer amount of information and going through the case, there's a lot of strangeness with it too. I mean, there were diaries found. There's paintings with information depicting prostitute killings. There's all these different suspects with varying degrees of knowledge. There's letters to the newspaper taunting the police. There are some letters that supposedly were written before it was publicly known that a murder had taken place. There's so many inconsistencies. There, this case just is so bizarre, but I think I'm not a hundred percent sure whether it can be solved with previous information only, or there needs to be more information dug up because there's already so much information available. But I think if the facts can be arranged and differentiated be- between what is relevant, what is not relevant, and the suspects eliminated for this podcast series, we're going to be doing suspect elimination instead of inclusion because they're already all named. So we'll be going through all of the suspects and kind of eliminating who could have done what when. And the other problem with this case, of course, is if one or two of the victims, the canonical five victims, weren't really victims of Jack the Ripper, now all of a sudden you can't necessarily remove people who had an alibi. The other important note is during this time period, first of all, prostitution was kind of normal. A lot of people did it on the side which I'll be getting into. And also murder wasn't viewed quite as serious as it is today. Obviously it was still a crime. People were hanged, people were executed, but people killed each other and it wasn't seen, it was seen as a big deal, but not as big of a deal as now. So that's another important thing to consider. It was more socially acceptable back in the day. Actually, that's true because like, it, like yeah, like way back in the day, it was just... Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it socially acceptable. It was frowned. I think the better way to put it is it was frowned upon slightly less. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So obviously it was a very bad thing to do. Nobody wanted to do it, especially Christian people. You're not supposed to murder. Like that was all set in stone, but it was just death in general was more prevalent or more obviously prevalent because of the disease and just people's health wars. It just, it was more in your face back then. So it was just, it was, it was more rough, but back to what I was saying about some people believe that Jack the Ripper would be caught today. If this has happened, 
you know, and other people point out that police don't generally care about prostitutes. So this is such a big issue because in the Whitechapel area, it was just uh, it was a destitute poverty area. It was the slums and the actual expression to go slumming. This is the main place that it originates from. Possibly not the first mention, but the most famous mention is poverty stricken London is where you go slumming. If you go, you know, you, you tour the streets and kind of say, oh, look at all these unfortunate people. These people belong to the unfortunate class. And, you know, something needs to be done about this. And this is relatively during the height of British power, the British Empire in the world. So they're going out conquering the world and amassing massive wealth while their own population is destitute, starving, driven to prostitution. And it was also a big area for a lot of people had alcohol problems. Alcoholism was a huge problem in the East End in Whitechapel. So I actually found an interesting post on Reddit, actually, referring to the mystique of Jack the Ripper. And I am going to read it because I think it will set the stage quite appropriately. The mystique of Jack and why his name rings out across the ages lies not just in the brutality of the crimes, nor the fact that he was a harbinger of the serial killers who would become an indelible part of the human experience in the decades which followed, but in the fact that he is unknown, the phantom killer who stalked the streets of Whitechapel so briefly before disappearing back into the night and fog from whence he came. I think knowledge of his identity would mean Jack would fade back into obscurity. Just another freak, the like of which has become commonplace, an accepted part of our existence, rather than the demon who lurks mysteriously just beyond our field of view. That person should be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> so you asked why he was called Jack the Ripper. That was actually a letter that was signed Jack the Ripper to the police. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, he was actually known as the Whitechapel Murderer. Pretty basic. Huh. Yeah, before that. So, wait, wait, so, wait, so wait, he signed the letter, Jack the Ripper? Yeah, the first letter in connection with this, with the killings was the Dear Boss letter, which was received in September 1888. And that's the first time it was used, Jack the Ripper. Now, the word rip actually was coins somewhere in the 1610s so that's ripping apart a tool for ripping apart something that rips and it was the definition came to mean a killer who mutilates his victims from 1890 but the huh. slang the slang meaning of, of ripper was actually it meant like really cool excellent brilliant awesome so someone who was a ripper was just a really cool person. So that like a ripping fellow or a splendid fellow. So that's the slang of it. So Jack the Ripper, someone who rips apart. And I guess the connotation is that he was brilliant at killing and ripping apart. Uh, I can see a, a lot of the teenagers copycatting him if they're, <laughs> yeah, if they're like, it would, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was completely insane. And also the thing we didn't really talk about, one of the other reasons why it's almost, it's over a century that it's captivated the imaginations of all these people, true crime, and just catapulted serial killers into superstardom is because of how grisly and gruesome the murders were. I mean, these people were eviscerated. These women huh. were brutalized more severe than any serial killer ever, pretty much. Can, can you explain the details of the of the first murder? Or are you of the eviscerations? That? We're not yeah. going to go into super details of the victims. We'll be going over those in the future podcast. But generally, the extreme brutalization of the victims escalated until it reached the final victim. Mary Kelly, the fifth. Oh, so so he was he was pushing the envelope on this. Uh... Suppose, supposedly, <laughs> we have to be really careful because none of this is confirmed as even Jack the Ripper. So, on one night known as the double event, he killed two in one night. Some people think it was him. Some people think it wasn't him. So we have to be really careful. But in general, the canonical five are regarded as such because of the escalating nature of violence. And then he just stopped. So some people think he also killed himself. 
Uh, so there's a lot of theories on why he stopped. But as I was getting into before, I want to kind of set the stage to Whitechapel and the victims. This is actually from Ranker.com, and I thought it was very, very interesting. Jack the Ripper has gone down in history as one of the most notorious, chilling, and mysterious serial killers of all time. Between August and November 1888, he killed five women in London, the center of the British Empire. The killer was never caught, spurring a host of theories about who exactly this madman or madwoman actually was. Which, side note, some people think it was Jill the Ripper. Because of the ease of which she could get away because people wouldn't necessarily suspect a woman at that time. And if she was a midwife or someone who was helping women give birth, she would have blood over her and that would be commonplace. So she could kind of get in and out of areas. So a Jill the Ripper theory, we'll do a dedicated podcast on that. There are some legitimate Jill the Ripper theories. I really like that. That's interesting because like you could see like a woman gaining the trust of another woman and pulling her into the alley and doing her thing, you know? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. He was neither the first nor the last serial killer who targeted women. But what about Jack the Ripper's victims? In the hunt to identify him and obsess over the smallest details of his crimes, the women killed by Jack the Ripper often get overlooked and forgotten. Though historians have not all come to a consensus about the total number of Jack the Ripper's victims, there is a group of the so-called Canonical Five, Marianne Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Kelly. Though history remembers these women merely as prostitutes whose professions led to their deaths, they were a lot more than simply sex workers. They lived complicated, interesting lives filled with a variety of challenges. These women were among the poorest residents of London, often living penny to penny in one of the most crowded, unhealthy corners of the city, the East End. At a time when the British Empire was the envy of all nations, these five women where evidence the prosperity of empire had left a huge segment of the population behind. Their names would be remembered, while his true identity remains unknown. Their stories are fascinating, heartbreaking, and deserve to be told. Some of the victims were immigrants. The East End was a culturally diverse place thanks to the immigrants who came there for cheap housing and industrial jobs. The two biggest immigrant groups were the Irish and Russian Jews, but the East End was also home to various other immigrant communities. Jack the Ripper's victims were no exception to this East End reality. Elizabeth Stride had emigrated from Sweden in 1866 when she was around 23. Mary Kelly, the final canonical Ripper victim, was said to have been Irish, having made her way to London in the early 1880s. Prostitution was one of the quickest ways for East End women to make money. Women in the East End often used prostitution as a form of infrequent, casual labor whenever they needed money. Many of them were not strictly prostitutes, but performed sex work along other tasks like child care or laundry work. Jack the Ripper's victims weren't strictly prostitutes. They were women who sometimes sold their bodies to make ends meet. Though women could make money selling their bodies, they often did not make much. According to Jack London, the American author of White Fang and Call of the Wild, who spent several weeks living amongst the London poor to do research for his book, People of the Abyss, some East End women would sell themselves for a stale loaf of bread or as little as two pence. By 1888, prostitutes had become a source of social panic amongst buttoned-up Victorians. Prostitutes were seen as either fallen women who were pushed into a life of vice or a dirty, disease-ridden criminal class no better than dogs. Some victims were walking the streets at night because they couldn't afford a bed. The sheer number of people who were crammed into the east end of London made it sometimes difficult to find affordable housing. Like many destitute East Enders, the majority of the Ripper victims did not have their own roof over their head. They often slept in communal lodging houses where they could rent a bed for a night, committed themselves to workhouses for room and board, or spent the night wandering the streets until morning. Marianne Polly Nichols, for example, could not afford a bed that cost four pence in a lodging house on the night of August 31st, 1888. So she pluckily put on her best bonnet, vowing to the housekeeper, I'll soon get my money. See what a jolly bonnet I have. 
Nichols set out that night to earn money so she could have a place to sleep. She never made it back. Hours later, her corpse was discovered on Buck's Row. How sad is that? Oh, that's, people, a, that's crazy. People just people would just wander the streets at night because they didn't have money for a bed oh. or somewhere to sleep. That's really, really sad. Like this whole Jack the Ripper case brings out like the worst in humanity. You have like a society of people that are just so poor and destitute doing the best they can but and then you have this murderer out there who's just committing the most gruesome crimes some of them were mothers a handful of jack the ripper's victims actually had children polly nichols had five children with her estranged husband the eldest of whom was in his early 20s when nichols was murdered annie chapman too was a mother several times over she had three children with her husband including a daughter who died of meningitis at the age of 12 and a son with a physical disability. Catherine Eddowes had three adult children. She had intended to visit one of her daughters to ask for money shortly before she was murdered. Some of them had been estranged from their families. Jack the Ripper's victims were not unattached single women who had no one to mourn their deaths. On the contrary, in an era with tremendous pressure on women to live out domestic bliss, some of them were actually estranged from their families and were outlaws from Victorian ideas of respectability. Annie Chapman, for example, had a seemingly happy, prosperous marriage. Her husband was a coachman with a relatively steady income. But the death of one of their children from meningitis sent the couple down a spiral and both turned to the bottle to cope. According to police reports, John Chapman blamed his wife's immoral habits for their parting ways. Polly Nichols' domestic tranquility ended when her husband, a printer, supposedly began an affair with the woman she had hired to nurse her youngest baby. Their 15-year marriage collapsed, helped in no small part by her addiction to alcohol. Though William Nichols agreed to financially support his wife after their separation, he ceased payments when he discovered she had become a prostitute. They all liked alcohol and may have been alcoholics. If all of the victims had one thing in common, it was that they liked to drink. A lot. Polly Nichols claimed she spent all of her lodging money on booze. Elizabeth Stride was also a heavy drinker, and her marriage to John Stride, a carpenter, dissolved because he claimed she drank too much. She was apparently a belligerent drunk and had been imprisoned for disorderly conduct a handful of times. At least two victims frequented the Ten Bells pub in the East End. One of them was murdered after looking for work outside of London. Since jobs were becoming hard to come by in the increasingly crowded East End, thousands of Londoners often skipped town for several weeks or months in the summer. They migrated to Kent, where they could pick hops, an essential ingredient in British beer, for the summer. Catherine Eddowes and her partner, John Kelly, were two such would-be pickers. Unfortunately, the couple could not find any work, probably because they were too late in the season, and so they walked back to London returning on September 27th, 1888. Since they had little money, Kelly literally sold the boots off his feet to make enough money for food and rest. Jack the Ripper would murder Catherine Eddowes only a few days later. At least one of them may have feared she would become a victim of Jack the Ripper. Dr. Thomas Bernardo was one of the leading and most controversial philanthropists in the East End. He routinely worked directly in the slums of London amongst the very people he hoped to save. In late September 1888, he was visiting a common lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street to interview destitute women. He spoke to many of them in the house's kitchen, and they were all apparently agitated about the murders. One even lamented, we're all up to no good, and no one cares what becomes of us. Perhaps some of us will be killed next. A few days later, Bernardo recognized Jack the Ripper's latest victim, Elizabeth Stride, as one of the women huddled in the kitchen, fearful for her life. How messed up is that? Yes, that's, that's crazy. It really takes you back to that time period because everybody was so just destitute and hope like there's just an aura of hopelessness in yeah. this area of Whitechapel and there's a killer on the loose just contributing that much more. Also important to note, I mean there were just ga there were gangs of people. There were people getting stabbed and killed all the time. Not in a, not in serial killer fashion, but just 
there were attacks. People used to rob prostitutes, uh, assault them, rape them. I mean, there, this was a crime ridden area. Jack the Ripper's crimes were only a small part. I mean, we're talking about a handful of murders here. So it's not like he killed dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Some people think he did, but in general, the, the official story, the official theory, he killed between five and 11. Uh, so, so someone got addicted. <laughs> Well, um, my point was that the general atmosphere, people got stabbed all the time back then. Yeah. People got into fights, people got killed. And this was not a pleasant place to live. Jack the Ripper just added to all that on top. Also, something I wanted to note for the people that think the case can't be solved, there's a lot of paperwork. I mean, there's a lot of details that are known. I mean, it's known what time people went to work, what address they stayed at. Who else was around them? People were interviewed and invest investigations were done. This was 1888, but it wasn't 1788. It wasn't 1688. It wasn't so long ago that there's no paper trail. I mean, we have, th we have photographs of the crime scene. Did you know that? No kidding. Oh, That's you didn't know awesome. that? Yeah, there's no, that, yeah. It, it's not awesome. It's they're the most disgusting photos you'll ever see. <laughs> and I suggest no one ever look at them. I'll, I'll look it up. Well, I, I feel like. Well, if you're an investigator, of course you're going to look it up and, and see the patterns or whatever. I mean, these these women were completely mutilated. I mean, they were mutilated and tortured. I mean, if they were alive, they were just tortured and ripped apart. Well, let, let me let me ask you this: Were the women, and I don't mean to, I don't know how. Well, were they were they more attractive than the average woman? Like, were you not or, paying attention to the entire podcast, Maxwell? They were middle aged alcoholics. Oh shit! I missed that one. Yeah, <laughs> I missed. I missed a very important detail. <laughs> well, you missed everything, so that's not surprising. <laughs> but anyway, oh, my my point with the whole investigation is like, there's police reports. I mean, there's also shady business with the reports. I mean, there were sealed files. There were diaries found after the fact. They were lost letters. I mean, there was a lot of things that are very bizarre and mysterious in this case. It's just piled right on top of each other. There's, there's a lot more than meets the eye to the Jack the Ripper uh. case. But, I mean, it's, it's so heartbreaking for the victims because these people were living very unfortunate lives. And for them to be killed, let alone in the manner in which they were killed, I mean, it's just, it's just horrible. Some of them had done time in workhouses. After her marriage to her husband ended, Polly Nichols admitted herself to the Lambeth workhouse since she literally had nowhere else to go. Committing oneself to the workhouse was a relatively common strategy for the London poor, though it was usually a last resort. Though the days were long and hard, workhouses provided meals and a bed, which was more than some people could find on the streets. Polly Nichols was not the only Ripper victim to do time in a London workhouse. Elizabeth Stride was known to have entered the Poplar workhouse at one point as well. Mary Kelly owed back payments in the room where she was murdered. Mary Kelly was one of the lucky ones. She had her own room at 13 Miller's Court, so she didn't have to worry about finding a bed at the end of each day. Having one's own room was a substantial expense in East London. Kelly paid four shillings and six pence weekly for the room, and at the time of her death, her rent was nearly seven weeks past due. After Kelly was murdered in her room, the only canonical Ripper victim to be killed indoors... In the early hours of November 9th, 1888, her mutilated body was discovered only because her landlord had sent an agent to collect her back rent. The man saw her corpse through the window and immediately reported the gruesome scene. One of the other points in the Jack the Ripper case is that if Mary Kelly really was the last victim, she was killed indoors and it was the most gruesome scene because he had more time because it wasn't simply on the street hack slash possible organ removal, and then run away, he actually had more time to kill her. And for whatever reason, he kind of realized if he didn't have that chance again, he couldn't kill again. He just wanted to escalate, and he didn't have the opportunity to do so. And then if he went completely insane, he would have killed himself at that point. Or some people theorize he escaped to New York City or elsewhere. And we will be going over all those theories as well. Catherine Eddowes had been released from jail only to meet Jack the Ripper on the street. The London police were generally in the habit of locking up drunk people for a few hours until they sobered up and then releasing them. 
That is what happened to Catherine Eddowes. On the night of her murder, Catherine Eddowes had been brought to prison for drunken, disorderly conduct. After a few hours in a cell, she was released. At some point during her walk back to her lodging house, she crossed paths with Jack the Ripper and was murdered in Mittery Square in the early morning hours of September 30th, 1888. At least one of the victims had been treated for STDs. In the 19th century, throughout Europe and its colonies, it was becoming increasingly common for suspected prostitutes to be detained and treated in lock hospitals, institutions specifically geared towards treating venereal diseases. They were controversial, but nonetheless provided poor women with access to medical treatment. While still in Sweden, Elizabeth Stride appears to have been institutionalized at a VD hospital. On and off throughout the spring and fall of 1865, Stride was a patient at the Curhaset Hospital where she received treatment for an STD and gave birth to a stillborn baby. How heartbreaking is all this information about these victims? Yeah, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, a lot of the people's attitudes about Jack the Ripper, oh, he killed prostitutes, yeah, whatever, they were just lowly prostitutes. They really weren't. They were very common for the time. I mean, these were these were people who worked different professions. They were mothers. They were housewives. They were wives. Some of them married. Some some of them left their marriage mm -hmm. or whatnot. Some of them. Did, it's did, did he ever kill uh, a high profile woman? Well, supposedly no. None of the official victims were high profile. No. But if you also factor in, some people think this was just a local lunatic running around. So he would kill whoever was in that area. So there really weren't any high society prominent women in that area. So if he was killing whoever was there. So I, again, I want to really emphasize that these canonical five were not prostitutes. Mary Kelly was the only one who was more or less a real prostitute. So these were women who, who were cleaning or selling, making and selling items they were normal people. It was commonplace for, the, for this unfortunate or poor class of people in London to do prostitution on the side. Like today, you might get a second job at like a warehouse or a grocery store clerk or whatnot. Back then, it was prostitution on the side. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it wasn't viewed, it wasn't viewed the same way it's viewed now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was still looked down upon, of course. I mean, we're talking about puritanical values of Victorian England, but it was just more commonplace and out in the open, like if right. you know, than it than right, it was right, now. Right. So huh. there's also no real evidence that they were actively soliciting when they died. So if they're roaming the streets or whatnot, I mean, one or two of them probably was, but it's not like we can say, oh, they were out trying to pick up a John. Which that is interesting. Why it's not John the Ripper, but it's Jack the Ripper. But well, if he, if he wasn't a customer, then uh, you know, I guess he wouldn't be a John. I see. And Ch I wonder, Chapman, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like, try to guess what his method was. There has to be like a a uh, routine method of luring them into. Well, we also you know, can't assume. We also can't assume it, it was one person who did all these things. But if it were, so Chapman may have been asleep when she was killed. In, the, in a yard, Stride was waiting to meet someone, and Eddowes was on her way to her lodging house when she was released from police custody. So these are people who are just on the street, and if he's roaming the street, he just rushes up, attacks them, and runs away. I mean, there were witnesses to Jack the Ripper. People saw him. Wow. I mean, this no was, kidding. This was at night. I mean, we'll, we'll get into that. Just, in just, not, just not identifiable, I guess. They actually gave a description. Not to tease, but we'll go over all of the all of the witness testimony in a future podcast where we will dissect all of the different suspects, the MO, whether or not all of these canonical five are actually victims of Jack the Ripper, and whether or not other victims also belong to Jack the Ripper. But in general, this is just one of the most bizarre, insane cases that it just doesn't stop. Every it seems like every one or two or three decades, there's just drastic new information that's revealed. I mean, there's that's, a that's interesting. I'm I'm i I guess the especially the DNA evidence is coming to uh uh I guess new conclusions or well there it, there's alternate theories 
popping up all the time. I mean, we we have uh, we also have Maybrick, which a diary basically he admits to being Jack the Ripper. Now, whether or not the diary was forged or not, they go back and forth on that. The yeah, it's it's the whole case is is very very bizarre and it has a lot of twists and turns. Some people even think Jack the Ripper was a time traveler. Huh. I well, I definitely look forward to all the the findings and the research. That'll be kind of fun. Yeah, this is probably going to be our most extensive series. But uh, the DNA test supposedly proved that Jack the Ripper was Polish immigrant Aaron Kosminski. So again, we actually went over DNA for dummies in our Stephen Avery podcast. So just because the DNA happened to match, that it also could match ten percent of the population. So, Kazminsky was actually a hairdresser who died in an insane asylum in 1919. Huh. So there was a shawl from his victim that apparently had DNA on it. So anyway, we'll 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 do Kazminsky in a dedicated podcast. There was made, I mean, there there was so many suspects. There's over 120 suspects, and some of them will surprise you. We'll 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 save a couple of mind shocks. For those, but even some really famous people have been accused of being Jack the Ripper. Some of them have alibis. Some of them don't. (laughs) So, yes, we look forward to going down every single avenue of the Jack, or once again, alleyway, every single alley of the Jack the Ripper case. But hopefully people, our listeners out there, have new insight into the victims and the Whitechapel area of London and the all of the sentiment surrounding the case. I mean, these were real people who were living lives, unsavory lives in a destitute state of turmoil and unpleasantness. I mean, it was not a happy time to be living in Whitechapel in the 1880s. And so, yeah, all of that needs to be kept in mind when dealing with this case. And once again, there is plenty of evidence. There's police files, documents, photographs of the murder scene. I believe the information is all there to identify Jack the Ripper. And I believe if the information is not there, it is out there somewhere. I don't think this is a lost cause case like many do. Some people think the entire realm of Ripperology and Ripperologists is based on the fact that that it can never be conclusively proven. So some people look at it as just a big money making scheme to come up with it with all these theories and just keep book deals going and conferences and and documentaries. But like any subject, I mean, are you going to say that about Egyptology or any subject? I mean, any subject is going to make money if people are interested in it. So I don't really look at it that way. I think the information is all there. What do you think? Um, hey, you never know. Maybe we might be able to solve it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, we hope you enjoyed another episode of Mindshock True Crime. If you like our podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit notifications to get updates when we upload new podcasts. If you like the video, hit the like button. And make sure to leave any questions, comments, your favorite theories, or requests for anything to be covered in our podcast. And you can check us out on social media, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, Patreon. Just check the description. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Maxwell Pappas. I will see you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And Maxwell Powers. And Johnny Mills. And you are listening to Jack the Ripper, the most famous serial killer in history. This is part two, Victimology. Now, the mythology that surrounds the Jack the Ripper case is pretty extensive. There are five victims so-called officially attributed to Jack the Ripper. They are known as the canonical five as part of the Jack the Ripper canon. We will be going over not only just these five, but quite a few other victims that actually might have belonged to Jack the Ripper and how that fits into identifying 
the killer. If you like our podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button for notifications on updates. You could also check us out on social media, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, Patreon. Just check the description. So, what I noticed, and I've, I've seen quite a few Jack the Ripper documentaries. I know you're sort of new to the case, Johnny. What do you know about Jack the Ripper? Um... He killed people. <laughs> he that was a Maxwell-type answer. <laughs> so Maxwell and I did the Behind the Infamy. That was part one of Jack the Ripper on kind of just going over the case in general and why it's had such a long-standing effect. But this case is actually... what what To me, what's fascinating is the amount of evidence in this case is astounding for something that happened in 1888. It's just astounding. We have records of when the victims went to work, where they lived, what time they met with people. We have witness reports. We have all these things. Now, one of the biggest problems in the case is even identifying who were definitive victims because some of the canonical five might not have been Jack the Ripper victims. And if that's true, that opens the door to a lot. We also need to examine how many other potential victims there could have been and where. There's a lot of weird coincidences in this case. I mean, we have serial killers from America just happening to be in London at the time period of the Jack the Ripper murders. We have a whole bunch of shady characters just skipping town right after the last murder. Some of them go to America. Some of them are even followed by Scotland Yard because they think that they're Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper actually might have went to New York, and we will be going into that as well. But it's just, it's curious because if the canonical five were not even attributed to Jack the Ripper, I mean, some of them obviously were. All depends on which theory you subscribe to. Jack the Ripper may have been more than one person. Jack the Ripper may have been a female. There's there's never-ending speculation. There's over 120 suspects, Johnny. You think we should cover them all in one podcast? Or spread it out a little bit? <laughs> I don't know. I was, uh, it's funny when you said female, though, because I pictured, like, Jackie the Ripper or something. How Jill that, the Ripper. Or how Jill? is that w- oh, yeah. DWB angle on it? <laughs> we will be getting into the DWB angle as well, Maxwell. Jack and Jill. There, There's, yeah. So, the canonical five are generally accepted as belonging to Jack the Ripper. They are grisly murders. In some cases, the organs are removed from the body. So... Early on, there was speculation that it might have been a surgeon of some kind or someone with medical knowledge. But other people dispute this as well because they kind of just say any any butcher that was familiar with animals would have been able to do it. Um, and it's not like they're doing, you know, organ transplants back then, right? Right? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I don't think they were able to do that till like... What, yeah, 50, I don't know about organ or transplants, or? but they probably took organs out, like an appendix or something. I don't know. Oh, of course they did for medical. Well, it was actually, they actually dug up dead bodies to steal organs. Oh. Because they would okay. sell them to medical schools. Uh, That's a good okay, way to I make can, some I money. I can see that. In 1954, the kidney was the first human organ to be transplanted successfully. Damn. Okay, also, so also they were mostly dead. just taking out organs to study them back then. Mm. Just to study, they weren't doing transplants. Also, even like fingerprint technology, a lot of these crime detection technologies were not available at the time. So we have to look at it through two lenses. We have to look at it through the investigators at the time eyes, which we'll be doing a dedicated podcast on the investigation. When how they we've start done doing fingerprint stuff, I just told this... you it's a couple years after uh, after what the Jack the Ripper murders. Oh, don't you pay attention, Maxwell? Wait, you just said it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so that that must have been eight, 18, 90 something. 1890 yeah so it's probably Jack the Ripper that started the whole fingerprint thing <laughs> right? maybe yeah not because like they couldn't figure it out so in the 19 it was actually more than a couple of years in the 1930s wow they started they discovered the existence of Latin fingerprints on the surface of fabrics most notably the insides of gloves discarded by perpetrators. Huh. huh. Fingerprint is on the inside of the glove. So they cut out the glove and look at it. <laughs> hmm. So that's late, 1930s, because, like, I thought, uh, well, because 1888, right, was Jack the Ripper? Mm-hmm. 1888. <laughs> yeah. 1888. 
yeah. so eighteen ninety would like would been what you said was fingerprinting started, but you said nineteen thirties based on yeah nineteen thirties. That sounds that sounds more right. I don't, I just I I don't know eighteen hundred. In eighteen ninety two, the first book was published on fingerprints. It's probably uh, Jack the River by <laughs> Sir Francis Galton, a British anthropologist and cousin of British. Charles Darwin. Oh, it's like these crazy uh, killings or like these crazy cases always brings out some sort of like technological advancement or something. <laughs> yeah, there's actually mm. there's plenty more that we didn't even get into. But, like Jack uh, the Ripper's fingerprinting were around the same time. And then it's like, well, I might as well say Simpsons it now. DNA. Sneakers were invented by the Scotland Yard police to catch Jack the Ripper because the shoes at the time were too loud. Sneakers. Oh, that's, that's why they're called funny. sneakers because they had to sneak around to catch Jack no the Ripper. No kidding. That's very interesting. What? I like that one. They had to sneak around. They called them sneakers. That's awesome. That's funny. Well, that's not it's awesome. kind of weird. 1858, Sir William Herschel, British administrator in the District of India, requires fingerprint and signature on civil contracts. In 1880, Dr. Henry Falds, a Scottish doctor in Tokyo, Japan, publishes an article in Nature. 1882, Alphonse Bertillon, a French anthropologist, devised a method of body measurements to produce a formula to classify individuals. The formula involves taking the measurements of a person's body parts and recording the measurements on a card. This, me this method of classifying and identifying people became known as the Bertillon system. 1891, Juan Vucetich, Argentine police official, initiated the fingerprinting of criminals. The first case used was the Rojas homicide in 1892, in which the print of a woman who murdered her two sons and cut her own throat in an attempt to place the blame on another person was found on a doorpost. In 18, so that's 1891, hmm. Argentina. 1892... Sir Francis Galton, a British anthropologist and cousin to Charles Darwin, publishes the first book on fingerprints. In 1896, the International Association of Chiefs of Police establishes the National Bureau of Criminal Identification for the exchange of arrest information. 1901, Sir Edward Henry, an inspector general of police in Bengal, India, develops the first system of classifying fingerprints. 1903, the William West, Will West case at a federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, changed the way that people were classified and identified. In 1905, the U.S. military adopts the use of fingerprints. Soon after, police agencies begin to adopt the use of fingerprints. 1908, the first official fingerprint card was developed. 1911, fingerprints are first accepted by U.S. courts as a means of reliable identification. Thomas Jennings was the first person to be convicted of murder in the U.S. based on fingerprint evidence. So this is 1911. So yeah, a couple years off. So it was it was a known technology, but they didn't they it wasn't really used. So yeah, the police yeah the police also knew a lot more than they have made public, and we will be going into the police investigation, police records, all those things. But for today, we're going to look at the canonical five and other victims because I have yet to see a comprehensive list anywhere of every single possible victim being discussed on either podcasts or documentaries. So the first generally accepted victim is Mary Ann Nichols. So this is August 31st, 1888. Born Mary Ann Walker on August 26th, 1845 in Dawes Court, Shoe Lane off Fleet Street. She was christened in or some years before 1851. You see how meticulous these records are, Maxwell? Like they, they know approximately when she was christened. <laughs> It's the, crazy. I can't believe they kept so much detail in the records. At the time of her death, in the East London Observer guessed her age at 30 to 35. At the inquest, her father said she was nearly 44 years of age, but it must be owned that she looked 10 years younger. But she didn't have a birth certificate? Well, they said she was born on August 28, 1845, so I'm guessing they did. Uh, the London Observer was the one who guessed her age. Ah, so and so she was five two, brown eyes, dark complexion, brown hair turning gray, five front teeth missing, and teeth slightly discolored. Is she that also before or after she got killed. Before, <laughs> a lot of people had missing teeth. So what Maxwell and I discussed the Whitechapel district of the East End of London. It is not a pleasant place to live. Like people were very downtrodden, and some of these women are widely reported as being prostitutes, but they weren't really. These were side jobs. 
it was common for poor women to kind of moonlight as prostitutes, but that's not their main profession. Like if you have your main nine to five and you also do like a little job on the side, you're not going to call your side job your profession. And that's kind of what was done with this case. He didn't, these weren't really prostitutes. Mm. But, One they, or, but they were like a side prostitute or something. Occasionally. Not, yeah. Some of them weren't even, pre, weren't even doing it when they were killed. So it's almost, it's, you'd be a little bit more accurate in saying these were random, more random victims. We'll be going into the specifics of the victims and Jack the Ripper's MO and the slight, di- and the differences in MO in some of these cases. But the other thing that's really bizarre about this case is there were a lot of police stationed. There were constables patrolling constantly. The windows of time where he could have done this were very small. So... It's not a lot of people when they think Jack the Ripper, they think like these abandoned alleyways in the dark. There were police patrolling all over the place. Hmm. So the, the Jack the Ripper had very narrow windows of time to get away with his crimes. And the other thing that's kind of bizarre in some of these crime scenes, there wasn't a lot of blood. And we will be going into the logistics of the killings in a dedicated podcast, but this is not an average run-of-the-mill serial killer case. One of the reasons it continues to fascinate more than a century after they occurred. And she also had a small scar on her forehead. So this is Marianne Nichols, August 31st, 1888. Annie Chapman, September 8th, 1888. Elizabeth Stride, September 30th, 1888. Catherine Eddowes, September 30th, 1888. He supposedly killed two women in one night. This is known as the double event. Hmm. And then Mary Jane Kelly, November 9th, 1888, which was the most gruesome, and supposedly this was his last victim. Now, Mary Jane Kelly, he actually killed her indoors in her room. So this was the most gruesome, probably one of the most gruesome crimes ever committed to a human being. Like, she was completely eviscerated. She's just... The brutality of the murder is insane, and he might not have killed again. So, yeah, those are the canonical five. So, Annie Chapman, born Annie Eliza Smith, also known as Dark Annie, Annie Siffy, Annie Sivy, or Annie Sivy, born in September 1841, no exact date. She was five foot, 47 years old at the time of death. This also kind of dispels the myth that these were young, attractive prostitutes that the killer just selected. I mean, these are middle-aged women with drinking problems. Everybody in uh, Whitechapel had drinking problems. So she's five foot, 47, pallid complexion, blue eyes, dark brown, wavy hair. She did supposedly have excellent teeth, possibly two missing in the lower jaw, and she was stout. However, undernourished and suffering from some kind and suffering from tuberculosis. God. She was not described as an alcoholic, even though she liked to drink. Elizabeth Stride, also known as Long Liz, was born Elizabeth Gustav's daughter on November 27, 1843, on a farm called Stora Tumheld in Torslanda Parish, north of Gothenburg, Sweden. She was baptized on December 5th of that year and confirmed in a church in Torslanda. At the time of her death, she was 45 years old. Pale complexion, light gray eyes, curly dark brown hair. All the teeth in her lower left jaw were missing. And she was 5'5", five, five, which I guess was very tall for the time. Long Liz. <laughs> Wait, which one, which one is this? Which lady? What? Which lady was this one? Elizabeth Stride. Long Liz. The one with no teeth on the bottom side. Because I'm looking at Mary Kelly's photograph, too, and it's kind of like the same. They look the same. Lodgers described her as a quiet woman, as a quiet woman who would do a good turn for anyone. (laughs) However, she had frequently appeared before the Thames Magistrate Court on charges of being drunk and disorderly, sometimes with obscene language. Oh, man, she used bad language. She made money by suing and charring and received money from... Michael Kidney, and was an occasional prostitute. So that same night, Jack the Ripper supposedly killed Catherine Eddowes, a.k.a. Kate Kelly. Catherine Eddowes, born April 14, 1842, in Graysley Green, Wolverhampton. At the time of her death, she was five feet tall, had hazel eyes, dark auburn hair. She also had a tattoo in blue ink on her left forearm. The tattoo said T.C., She was also suffering from Bright's disease. 
Friends spoke of Catherine as an intelligent scholarly woman, but one who was possessed of a fierce temper. So Mary Jane Kelly, a.k.a. Mary Jeanette Kelly, a.k.a. Mary Ann Kelly, also known as Ginger or Fair Emma. Mary Jane Kelly was approximately 25 years old at the time of her death, which would place her birth around 1863. She was 5 foot 7 inches tall and stout, blonde hair, blue eyes, fair complexion. She is said to have been possessed of considerable personal attractions, so fairly good-looking. Maria Harvey, a friend of hers, said that she was much superior to that of most persons in her position in life. Supposedly, she also spoke fluent Welsh. Joseph Barnett says that he always found her of sober habits. Landlord John McCarthy says when in liquor she was very noisy, otherwise she was a very quiet woman. Catherine Pickett claimed she was a good, quiet, pleasant girl and was well liked by all of us. So the the thing the weird thing about Mary Jane Kelly is that there really isn't a lot known about her, which has given the rise to conspiracy theories. There's even a theory that she never even died. And there was weird stuff going on with who that was, was she a different person? And almost everybody in the case is a suspect. So you have the husbands, the boyfriends, the landlord. They're all suspects in the case. So they're like, oh, well, if he was Jack the Ripper, he would say this or that. Mm. It's it's absolutely bizarre. Who is H.H. H. Holmes? So that was one of the most notorious American serial killers. We are going to do an episode on whether or not he was Jack the Ripper. But just quick offhand, it seems like he wasn't. Okay. So it's it not... Just, a, I, it's interesting, but uh, yeah, they're saying that Meghan Markle is uh, related to him, H.H. H. Holmes. Who's that? The actress that married uh, Prince Harry, or fiancé. Yeah, that's more of a Maxwell uh, area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, that's random. Because you just search uh, Jack the Ripper, that's like one of the first things that come up on news. <laughs> like eighth cousin or something to H.H. H. Holmes. Isn't, isn't Maxwell like 50th cousin? When you go down that road. <laughs> to Trump? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. We're all related. So the victims also, the, all these crimes occurred within a small area. I'm talking about a 15 block radius roughly. So when we look at timelines, MOs, who Jack the Ripper was, whether he killed all of them, whether he killed some of them, if we kind of dogmatically box ourselves into thinking, oh, it was only these canonical five, and it was definitely all five. The double event I find a little troubling as well because of the logistics of that crime, committing them back to back. Also, the time... What do you mean by double event? <clears throat> well, I just went over this when he yeah. killed two in one night. Okay, got it. Known as the double event. <clears throat> so... Well, okay, there there were about 11 women murdered around the time of the Ripper's reign. Five victims supposedly stood around from the rest, the canonical five. So, supposedly, they had distinct and similar wounds, post-mortem organ removal, and mutilation in certain cases. Another theory, once again, that there was some weird morgue stuff going on, which we will have to do a dedicated podcast on. So... There were also conflicting reports of when the organs were removed because it is possible that, for example, someone looking to sell organs on the black market for money removed some of the victim's organs in the morgue and the Ripper himself did not do it. Yeah. So when we factor that in, again, that casts doubts on the canonical five. Hmm. So they could have possibly been killed by someone else. They were killed so, in... So that's why, like, the photographs is crucial at the scene. I think I only seen, like, one photograph w with one of the victims. I think it was hmm. Mary or something. But. So these five victims were killed in the darkness, early morning hours. All the murders occurred on the weekend or within a day of the weekend and happened towards the end of the month or within a week, roughly. So, Sir Melvin McNaughton, who had been the assistant chief constable of the Metropolitan Police Service and head of the Criminal Investigation Department, wrote a report in 1894 that stated, The Whitechapel murderer had five victims, and five victims only. 
So the McNaughton Memorandum, which was looked at, that had the names of suspects, he came on the case a year after, so he wasn't even around for the original murders. So some people dispute the validity of, not that he was necessarily being dishonest, although he could have been, but he, it could have been biased or incomplete. But he believed there were only five victims. The police surgeon, Thomas Bond, also linked the killings together in a letter that he wrote to Robert Anderson, head of the London CID, on November 10th, 1888. So let's go through how the victims were killed. Mary Ann Nichols, so the body of Mary Ann Polly Nichols, was discovered in the wee morning hours of August 31st, 1888, at about 3.40 a.m. by two carmen on their way to work. Her body was found in front of a gated horse stable entrance on Bucks Row, Whitechapel. The two men who happened upon her, Charles Cross and Robert Paul, saw Polly lying on the ground with her skirts pulled up to her waist. At first, they weren't sure if she was either passed out drunk or dead but after some hesitation they approached her and felt her hands and face which were both cold to the touch feeling very uneasy about what they had just stumbled upon the men hurried off to alert the first constable they could find minutes later she was discovered by pc john neal while passing through buck's row while on the nightly beat he shone his lantern on polly's body which revealed her lifeless eyes staring up into the sky her throat had been deeply severed in two locations nearly decapitating her and her lower abdomen partially ripped open by a deep jagged wound the killer had also made several other incisions in her abdomen with the same knife the doctor who had arrived at the scene to examine her body had deemed her time of death to be less than 30 minutes from the time she'd been found Annie Chapman. A witness had reported seeing Annie Chapman talking with a man outside 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, 5.30 a.m., the morning of her murder. Albert Kadosh, who lived at 27 Hanbury Street, reported hearing a woman in the next door backyard say, No, followed by what sounded like a body falling against a fence. Approximately 20 minutes later, her badly mutilated body was found by Carter John Davis near a doorway in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. Her throat had been cut in much the same manner as Marianne Nichols had been slashed, and her abdomen ripped entirely open. Her intestines, torn out and still attached, had been placed over her right shoulder. A later autopsy revealed that the killer had removed her uterus and parts of her genitals. Elizabeth Stride, the Ripper, would claim two victims in the early morning hours of September 30th, 1888, the first of which was Elizabeth Stride. Her body was discovered in Dutzfield's yard off Burner Street at approximately 1 a.m. The killer had cut her throat, severing her left artery, yet no other slashes or incisions had been made. Because of the absence of abdominal mutilations, there had been some doubt as to whether or not Stride was in fact killed by Jack the Ripper. However, most experts agree that Stride was murdered by the same killer due to the nature in which her throat had been cut. It's also believed that the reason Stride had not been mutilated like the others was due to an interruption of some sort. It's possible the killer feared he was in jeopardy of being detected by nearby witnesses and elected to flee before finishing his ritual. Catherine Eddowes, 45 minutes after Stride's body was found in Dutfield's yard, Eddowes' body was discovered in Mitre Square within the city of London. Eddowes' throat had been severed and her abdomen torn open with a deep, jagged wound. Her left kidney had been removed along with a major portion of her uterus. Just before Eddowes' mutilated body would be discovered in Mitre Square, an eyewitness saw her in the company of a man who he described as being 5 foot 7 inches tall, 30 years of age with a medium build, fair complexion, and a mustache. His attire gave him the overall appearance of a sailor. The Stride and Eddowes' murders were later referred to as the double event. Mary Jane Kelly Considered to be Jack the Ripper's swan song, Mary Jane Kelly's murder was the most gruesome of all the Whitechapel murders. She was found horribly mutilated, lying on the bed in her single-room flat where she lived at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street, Spitalfields. She was discovered at 10.48 a.m. on the morning of Friday, November 9th, 
1888. The landlord's assistant, Thomas Boyer, had been sent over to collect the rent, which she had been weeks behind in paying. When she didn't answer his knock on the door, Boyer reached his hand through a crack in the window, pushing aside a coat being used as a makeshift drapery. What he saw at that moment was absolutely horrific. Kelly's body was mutilated beyond recognition. Her entire abdominal cavity had been emptied out her breasts cut off and her viscera had been deliberately placed under her head and on the bedside table. Kelly's face had been hacked away and her heart removed, which was also absent from the crime scene. Kelly's murder was by far the most grisly and ritualistic of all. Following the death of Mary Kelly, it's generally believed that the Ripper's killing spree had ceased. The murders that followed did not bear any striking similarities to those that occurred between August 31st and November 9th, 1888. So, initial impressions on the Canonical Five. What do you guys think? Do you guys think it was definitely the work of one guy? Two guys working together? Or possibly one of them could have been a copycat? I mean, if... If there's a serial killer on the loose and for whatever reason you want to kill somebody, that would be a good way to do it, right? You kill somebody in the same manner as a serial killer, then it would be attributed to the serial killer, not you. We need a dedicated podcast on the letters of Jack Dripper. There were hundreds of letters sent to the police and the press. Hmm. Most of them are... trying to get credit for the murders. (laughs) Well, most of them are regarded as hoaxes because in order to... It's kind of believed 99% of them, if not 100, are hoaxes because... The killer wouldn't really have time to have a job or do any killing if all he was doing is writing letters all day. (laughs) (laughs) But just general off-the-bat thoughts, Canonical 5, Jack the Ripper victims, yes, no, maybe, uncertain. No way to know. Was there anybody else doing these kind of killings before that? Like, that's what I want to know is just... You mean in the year to this? In the year or two before? Yeah. Well, okay, Maxwell, before I get into that, any thoughts? Um, Well, it, it happened... I don't know. It happened within three years, so that's like there's five of them. Well, they happened within a few months. Uh, <laughs> it was August 18, to November. 88 to 1891, right? April. You're looking at the canonical five. The canonical five started with Marianne Nichols, August 31st. Mary Jane Kelly was November 9th. Mm. So is that what you're reading? Like they? Think well, you know what else is weird? To those? Well, well, I'm gonna go over the other victims. I'm, we're talking about the canonical five now. Maxwell, we're talking about Nichols, Chapman, Stride, Eddowes, and Kelly right now. Just yeah. those five. That's who we're talking about. These are the commonly accepted Jack the Ripper victims, which we're talking a couple months. What I find weird is he took October off. Because <laughs> August 31st, September 8th, September 30th, and then nothing until November 9th. He takes all of October off. Halloween's usually a big-time mm-hmm. occult holiday. So he took... so. And I don't think, I'm not sure. He took his kids trick or treat. <laughs> <laughs> he took the whole month off, so it's kind of weird. So, Maxwell, thoughts? Planning? I don't know. It was August 31st through November 9th. That was the canonical five. I don't know. He needed a break, I guess. All right. So, let's go into the. I'm not going to go into most likely to least likely. There's. 13 other theoretical victims in varying degrees of probabilities. I'm going to go over all of them in chronological order. So the early the typically the earliest even remote possibility victim would be Fairy Fay and this is December 26th, 1887. Hmm. So quite a while beforehand now we don't even know if fairy fay exists with certainty but an unknown female claimed by two authors as having been a ripper victim in the alleys of commercial road on boxing night 1887 the first author to claim she was a whitechapel murder victim was journalist and historian Terence Robertson, who wrote in the October 29, 1950 edition of Reynolds' News that Fairy Fay was the name given to a woman who was killed while taking a shortcut home from Mitre Square Pub, although there was no such pub in Mitre Square. According to Robertson, Inspector Edmund Reed headed the inquiry into the death of the woman for a few weeks until finally frustration set in and after no information was found, told Scotland Yard he would close the case. It might appear that this alleged ripper victim arose from the journalist's imagination. 
Robertson led a colorful and controversial career and apparently died by his own hand in New York City on January 31st, 1970, while investigating a Canadian liquor mogul. <laughs> the second author known to have written about Fairy Fay was Tom Cullen. In his Autumn of Terror, Cullen related the same story told by Robertson, but added the important fact that she was, in fact, mutilated. The truth appears to be that Scotland Yard had no records of Reed's investigation into this alleged murder of Fairy Fay. No newspapers have been found with any mention of a woman named Fairy Fay who died on Boxing Night 1887 or any other night for that matter, nor does the name appear in any death register. Several women with names similar to Fairy Fay have been found, Sarah Fayer, Alice Farber, and Emma Fairy. These women died in either December 87 or December 86 but none of them were murder victims. So, the general consensus amongst ripperologists in the field of ripperology, the study of Jack the Ripper, believe that she never existed. The next possible theoretical victim would have been Annie Millwood, February 27th, 1888. So, this is a possible victim mentioned in Sugden's The Complete Jack the Ripper and Hinton's From Hell. She was the widow of a soldier named Richard Millwood. Annie was 38 years of age in the winter of 88. She lived in Spitalfields Chambers, 8 White's Row, Spitalfields, and may have been supporting herself through prostitution, although that is pure speculation. Annie was admitted into the Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary on Saturday, February 25th, 1888 from 8 White's Row, Spitalfields. Record report the cause of admission simply as stabs to the legs and lower torso with a knife. An article in the Eastern Post sheds a bit more light on the subject. It appears the deceased was admitted to the Whitechapel Infirmary suffering from numerous stab wounds in the legs and lower parts of the body. She stated that she had been attacked by a man who she did not know and who stabbed her with a clasp knife, which he took from his pocket. No one appears to have seen the attack and as far at present ascertained there is only the woman's statement to bear out of the allegations of the attack, though that she had been stabbed cannot be denied. In her own words, the man was a stranger. The exact number of wounds is unknown. Regardless, Annie made a complete recovery and was released a little less than a month later, on March 21st, being sent to the South Grove Workhouse, Mile End Road. Strangely, ten days later, on March 31st, she collapsed and died in the backyard of the building while engaged in some occupation. Coroner Baxter headed the inquest on April 5th, and her death was attributed to sudden effusion into the pericardium from the rupture of the left pulmonary artery through ulceration. The death was from natural causes unrelated to her vicious attack over a month before. Although rarely mentioned in the Ripper murders, it is interesting to note that there are certain similarities to her murder and Martha Tabram's murder. Martha Tabram is generally the most likely sixth victim, if there is a, vic a sixth victim, of Jack the Ripper. And Tabram was 39, Millwood was 38. White's Row is only minutes away from George Yard, the site of Tabram's murder. Injuries, repeated stab wounds to the lower torso, are similar to the 39 stabbings of Tabram. So if Tabram is not a Jack the Ripper victim, whoever attacked Tabram might have also attacked Annie Millwood. However, if Tabram is included as the sixth canonical Ripper victim, then Millwood might have to be looked at as well. And Tabram was August 7th, 1888, so just a couple weeks before Nichols. August 31st. Chronologically, next up, we have Ada Wilson, March 28th, 1888. And all of this info is from casebook.org, a very good resource. Ada Wilson, on the belief that the Ripper must have not begun his career as a full-fledged mutilation murderer, or even a murderer at all, it has been speculated that Ada Wilson, a sempstress living at 19 Maiden Street, Mile End, might have been a victim of one of the Ripper's early attacks. 
On March 28, 1888, while home alone at 19 Maidman Street, Wilson answered a knock on the door to find a man of about 30 years of age, 5 foot 6, with a sunburned face and a fair mustache. He was wearing a dark coat, light trousers, and a wide awake hat. The man forced his way into the room and demanded money. When she refused, he stabbed her twice in the throat and ran, leaving her for dead. It was reported that nearby neighbors almost captured the man, but he found escape. Lucky for her, Ada Wilson survived the attack and lived to relate the story to the authorities. There are four reasons why people think this could be attributed to the Ripper. One, the description of the attacker, which fits many eyewitness accounts of the Ripper. Two, the knife being used as a weapon and the throat being a target. And four, she's a seamstress, which is a common term by prostitutes to describe themselves. So one thing that the Ripper isn't known to do is to demand money and robbery. So he's more of a sadistic psycho killer who hates women. That's the general MO and criminal profile, which we will go into in a dedicated episode. So it's not quite the same here, but if he's a psychotic criminal... I mean, we can't necessarily rule out that he would do that, right? So I guess it depends on whether or not you believe if he had an evolving M.O. Because the murders kind of became more and more gruesome, culminating with Mary Kelly, if you believe she was the last victim, which was the most brutal. Emma Smith, on April 3rd, 1888, is another potential victim. So this case is a little weird. 45 years of age, a mother of two, a widower, and a prostitute, Emma Smith is generally looked upon as something of a mystery. Her acquaintances gave her a much higher standing than others of her kind would have received, and the events which were to lead to her death still caused the casual reader to wonder at the absolute strength of this woman. Emma claimed to have both a son and daughter living somewhere in the area of Finsbury Park and was often heard to say that they should do something to help her situation. She had been a prostitute for some time, at least since she last saw her husband. She also claimed to have been a widow and claimed to have left her husband in 1877. <laughs> Emma was also somewhat of a belligerent woman, often seen with a black eye and other various cuts and bruises as a result of many a drunken brawl. <laughs> she was a brawler. She had been living at 18 George Street for about a year and a half with a routine practically set in stone. She'd leave her lodgings between 6 and 7 in the evening, practice her trade for the night, and return in the small hours of the next morning. And so it went on bank holiday night, Easter Monday, April 3rd, 1888, that she left around 6 p.m. searching for trade. She was next seen by Margaret Hayes at around 12.15 a.m. This is kind of specific, Maxwell. Look at all these records in the Jack the Ripper case. We know the time she was seen talking to people. She was seen at 12.15 a.m. talking to a man dressed in dark clothes and a white scarf in Ferenc Street, Limehouse. The next time she was seen was about four hours later when she staggered into her lodgings at George Street, her face bloodied and her ear cut with her woolen shoulder wrap pressed between her thighs to clog the injury which would later lead to her death. As would later report, she was returning home that night, probably the worst for drink, when at least three or four youths began following her from Whitechapel Church. They would stop her on the corner of Brick Lane and Wentworth Street, where they beat, raped, and viciously jabbed a blunt object into her genitals, tearing the perineum. The boys emptied her purse before leaving her to die on the street. Here's where the story becomes incredible. Having just been beaten and raped and having sustained a sizable and no doubt painful injury, Emma Smith stood up and walked back to her lodgings at 18 George Street. She had apparently removed her shoulder wrap and placed it between her thighs to soak up the blood which had undoubtedly been flowing from her ripped perineum. The lodging house deputy, Mary Russell, and lodger Annie Lee, amazed that she could even made it that far, rushed her to the London Hospital on Whitechapel Road, apparently against Emma's will. 
Once there, she was seen by George Haslip, the house surgeon, and she fought unconsciousness long enough to describe her assailants and the details of her assault. Finally, Emma could no longer stave off the severity of her injuries and succumbed to a coma in which she would die four days later. It is believed by most that it was one of the many Whitechapel gangs that killed Emma Smith and not the Ripper. High Rip gangs were known to patrol the area in which the incident occurred, extorting money from prostitutes and other downtrodden women in return for their protection. In fact, it wasn't until September of 88 that she was first attributed as a Ripper victim by the press. Emma's death is also important in that many believe it may have been a contributing factor in the creation of the mythical Fairy Fay murder. Some authors note that Fairy Fay was said to have been killed by a stake jabbed into her abdomen, much like Ebba was killed by a blunt object. Therefore, many women claim it was the means of Emma's murder combined with the date of Rose Milet's death, which led to the creation of the Fairy Fay murder. Whether or not Emma's death should be attributed to the Ripper is a question responded to in the negative by almost all Ripperologists. There is no reason to doubt her story that she was attacked by three or four men, no other Ripper victim, with the possibility of stride, was believed to have been killed by more than one man. Also, the fact that she was raped is not consistent with the other Ripper victims. In fact, to accept Emma as a veritable victim, one must accept that the Ripper was either part of a group at one time, or even part of a gang. Unfortunately, there is little evidence to back this theory. I don't know, what do you guys think? You think there could have been a Ripper gang of serial killers that kind of alternated? And some of them had slightly different MOs. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I don't know. Is there... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Johnny? That's rough. That was her story? That yeah. she said she was attacked three by four youths four or whatever? Three or four men, yeah. I don't know if anybody saw that, but she clearly was stabbed horribly and died from her injuries, so... <laughs> okay, so there was a shady character known as Fingers Freddy. <laughs> I wonder if this is where Freddy Krueger comes from. In his writings for The Sun in 1972, Superintendent Arthur Butler described the story of Fingers Freddy, who he claimed was a street showman who could perform various magic tricks, while accomplices would pick his spectators' pockets. <laughs> it was also alleged that this man was Emma Smith's protector, and that the two knew Jill the Ripper and planned to blackmail her by threatening to expose her as an illegal abortionist. This is one of the uh, Jill the Ripper theories. Smith turned up dead, and Freddy disappeared immediately after. It is unknown whether or not Freddy was also killed, as he simply may have fled the area knowing his life was in danger. That's kind of interesting. So, let's move on to Martha Tabram. August 7th, 1888. So she's the most likely to be a fifth, if there was a fifth, by most Ripperologists' estimations. So Martha Tabram is kind of accepted as being the most likely sixth victim, if there was a sixth victim. Tabram, a hawker and a prostitute in the East End, was brutally murdered in the early morning hours of August 7th, 1888. On the eve of her murder, Tabram was out drinking with an acquaintance, a fellow unfortunate who went by the name of Pearly Paul, and two soldiers at a public house near George Yard Buildings. Shortly after midnight on August 6th, Tabram and her friend paired off with their clients, Tabram heading through the archway into George Yard on Wentworth Street. Tabram's body was first encountered at around 3.30 a.m. on August 7th by Carmen George Crow. He had been returning home from work, and because of the darkness in the stairwell, mistook her body as that of a drunk woman passed out on the landing. At around 5 a.m., her body was again discovered by another resident of George Yard Buildings, but by this time, there was enough light in the stairway to reveal her ghastly wounds. She had been stabbed 39 times. The wounds focused on her throat, chest, and lower abdomen, and appeared to have been inflicted by a pocket knife, with the exception of one violent stab through her chest, which looked to have been performed with a large dagger or bayonet. Many feel that Tabram was the Ripper's first victim due to the proximity of the murder in relation to the others, as well as the brutal nature of the crime. However, a number of experts also agree that another individual was responsible for Tabram's death and not Jack the Ripper. Tabram's wound patterns were distinctly different from the canonical five, in that she received multiple stab wounds as opposed to being slashed, which is believed to be the modus operandi 
of the Ripper. So there's also a few unidentified bodies that were found. On October 2nd, 1888, the headless and limbless torso of a woman was found dumped in a vault soon to become a section of the cellar of New Scotland Yard. The unidentified woman's arms were later found separately in the Thames River. So if there was another murder in October, that could possibly make the timeline fit a little bit better. The police had not attributed this incident to the Ripper at any time, despite rampant press speculation. They did suggest, however, that there could be a connection between this and the Pynchon Street murder. So the Pynchon Street murder occurred about a year later, on September 10th, 1989. We also have Annie Farmer on November 20th, 1888. The 40-year-old wife of a city road tradesman, Annie Farmer, left her husband and slowly reverted back to life as an unfortunate in the streets of Spitalfields. She went by a variety of nicknames, Flossie, Tilly, Dark Sarah, and Laughing Liz. On the morning of November 21st, 1888, the day after Mary Kelly's burial, Farmer picked up a man of shabby genteel, in a suit at 7.30 a.m. and returned with him to Satchel's Lodging House, 19 George Street, Spitalfields. He paid for a bed for both of them. Two hours later, Annie screamed loudly, and only moments later, the man flew out of the Doss house along George Street and into the Thrall Street. As he passed two cokemen, he exclaimed, What a cow! and then disappeared. Annie seemed quite distraught and claimed she was attacked by Jack the Ripper as her throat was lightly cut and bleeding. The crowds of George Street once again thought the Ripper had struck and gone free, and it wouldn't be long before panic overtook reason. The police, however, were skeptical of her claims as her injury was quite superficial and done with a blunt blade quite unlike the Ripper's deep wounds with a sharp weapon. And once it was discovered that she was hiding coins in her mouth... It was concluded that she had attempted to steal from the man and once discovered, lightly bruised her own throat with a blunt knife and screamed murder at her client, accusing him of being Jack the Ripper. The man, understandably frightened due to the very salient possibility of lynching, left as quickly as possible. The police called off the investigation and stopped searching for the man, believing he would turn himself in in order to clear his name. This never happened, and Framer never recanted her original story. So that's definitely one of the highly skeptical ones. We also have Rose Milet, December 20th, 1888. Milet was found strangled in Clark's yard on High Street, December 20th, 1888. Investigators assessed that her death may have been the result of a drunken stupor, as there were no visible signs of a struggle apparent anywhere on her body or clothing. Even though the inquest deemed it to be a murder, her death in no way resembled a Ripper victim. Hmm, a drunken stupor murder? There doesn't seem to be conclusive evidence there. There was also disagreement on her death. Some returned with a diagnosis of willful murder by strangulation, which is the Ripper's MO. Hmm. Elizabeth Jackson, June 1889. Elizabeth Jackson, also known as Lizzie, was born on March 18th, 1865, and was 24 at the time of her death in early June, 89. She was the daughter of John Jackson, a stonemason who was born in County Tipperary, Ireland, and his wife, Catherine, who was also born in Ireland but hailed from County Cork. Parts of Jackson's body were found in the Thames between May 31st and June 25th, 89. At the time of her death, she had been living as a prostitute in London's Soho Square. The New York World suggested that Jackson was the 10th victim of Jack the Ripper. However, there is no real reason to suppose that her death is connected with the Whitechapel murders. We also have Alice McKenzie, found July 17th, 1889, in Castle Alley, Whitechapel. She had suffered a severed carotid artery 
along with multiple small cuts and bruises across her body, evident of a struggle. One of the pathologists involved in the investigation dismissed this as a possible Ripper murder as it did not match with the findings of the three previous Ripper victims he had examined. Writers have also disputed McKenzie as being a victim of Jack the Ripper, but rather of a murderer trying to copy his M.O. in an attempt to deflect suspicion. Huh. That's weird. There's different theories on how old Jack the Ripper was. Some people think if he was old or diseased, he was he was trying to kill again, but was too weak to do it as strong as he did before. So there's a lot of weird theories like that. And Alice McKenzie is kind of falls into that category. So let's go over the Pynchon Street murder, September 10th, 1889. The victim was named as such because she was found headless and legless under a railway arch on Pynchon Street, Whitechapel, September 10th, 1889. Isn't this the type of place you'd want to live, Maxwell? <laughs> There's like body parts, torsos being found, people being killed, people being stabbed left and right. Investigators believe that the victim was murdered at a different location and then the body dismembered for disposal. Very, very bizarre. All right, are you ready to get crazy? Let's do it. Mm-hmm. So one of the latest victims, potential victims, is Francis Coles, February 13th, 1891. We're talking several years later now. She was found at Swallow Gardens, a passageway beneath a railway arch between Chambers Street and Royal Mint Street, Whitechapel, with her throat slit. Visible wounds on the back of her head suggested that Coles was likely thrown to the ground after having suffered to knife wounds across her throat. Apart from the cuts to her throat, there were no mutilations to her body. A man named John Thomas Sadler, who authorities believed to be Jack the Ripper, was arrested and charged with her murder, but was later discharged on March 3, 1891 due to lack of evidence. Very, very bizarre. All right, let's get into the mind shock realm of insanity. We have Carrie Brown, April 24th, 1891. What do you think is unique about her murder, Maxwell? She was murdered in New York. That's cool. I mean, not cool. Just so the that's what that's one of the uh, theories for the American murderer. Yes, some people believe Jack the Ripper left London and traveled to New York, including Scotland Yard, who tracked a suspect, which we will go over in a dedicated episode. I mean, there's actually numerous suspects who left London, and it's kind of weird how all these different suspects were leaving London right around the time after Kelly's death. Or even years later, because we have Carrie Brown here in 1891. That's really, really bizarre. So this is one of the few alleged Ripper victims actually to have been killed outside of London. Carrie Brown remains for the most part a mystery. An older American prostitute, Carrie's lifeless body was discovered in the room of the East River Hotel on the Manhattan waterfront in New York, United States, on the night of April 23rd to 24th, 1891. Before the release of Sugden's The Complete Jack the Ripper, very little was known of her and even less actually deemed worth writing about. She was, and still is, mentioned solely as a connection to the suspect George Chapman, who at the time of the murder was living in nearby Jersey City, New Jersey. Known fondly by her acquaintances as Old Shakespeare, due to her tendency to recite her favorite poet's sonnets after a few drinks, Carrie Brown checked into the East River Hotel on the southeast corner of Catherine Slip and Water Street with a man between 10.30 and 11 on the night of April 23rd. Her lifeless body was discovered lying on the bed the next morning, naked from the armpits down, according to the night clerk who found her. Her body was mutilated and she had been strangled. But there are few details known about her injuries. The details of the autopsy were played down a great deal by the press. And all we can know for sure is that there were cuts and stab wounds all over it. The doctor who performed the autopsy, named Jenkins, is said to have thought that the killer had attempted to completely gut his victim. Other than that, the exactness of her injuries remains a mystery. 
The murder of Carrie Brown remains unsolved. The question of whether or not it was a Ripper-related murder cannot at present be sufficiently answered. Detailed medical reports must be found concerning the exact nature of her injuries, and these must be matched to the M.O. of Jack the Ripper's canonical victims. If they do indeed match the injuries of, say, Chapman or Eddowes, then some serious rethinking concerning the case of the Jack the Ripper needs to be done. So there doesn't seem to be enough information even on that, which is strange. Are they keeping it under wraps? But newspapers did report that, you know, Jack the Ripper in New York or New York's Ripper. And there were also cases all over the world of similar eviscerations or disembowelments. Obviously, they can't all be Jack the Ripper, but it's theoretically possible that he had one, two, or a couple more victims elsewhere. We really have to go over the victims and the timelines and everything to get a good handle on everything that's going on but just impressions right off the bat i mean is it possible all of these victims are jack the ripper victims if he was some kind of gang member initially who just really liked using a knife <laughs> maxwell um, that's possible i mean if he's um i don't know he's used to killing or i don't know <laughs> no thoughts on the podcast <laughs> um i don't know i'm just looking through all these there's so many books written on jack the ripper it's insane they did some movies, too. I mean, I'm this podcast in... is specifically about whether or not there were more than five victims. Yeah. I don't know. Johnny? I mean, I think, I think, it's, I think you can't really dogmatically say there's only five or there's five and they're definitely Jack the Ripper because what if one or two of them wasn't Jack the Ripper? Now, you're, now, it's, now it's rough. And then what if a cu- one or two that weren't part of the canonical five were Jack the Ripper? So what we're going to attempt to do on this podcast series is, of course, lay out all the details, match up the timelines, and weigh all these different suspects in all these different situations to kind of see if there is a good suspect. If one or two murders don't line up, we have to really weigh that information because if we're saying there's definitely only five and a suspect has some kind of alibi for some of the other ones... I mean, that changes everything. If we don't even know the exact victims, how is it possible to find Jack the Ripper? DNA. <laughs> You're on the Kosminski bandwagon, Johnny? <laughs> Kosminski. Yeah, we're going to go over the main suspects and cases for and against. There's quite a few suspects that have good cases against them, and it couldn't have been all of them. But there could also have been... If there were two of them working together, that could explain some of the anomalies and inconsistencies in the case as well. But we hope you enjoyed another episode of Mind Shock True Crime. If you like our podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the video, like the video. Feel free to share it. And also leave any questions, comments, thoughts of any kind. And check us out on social media, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, Patreon. Just check the description. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Maxwell Powers. And Johnny Mills. See you guys next time.
If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Jack the Ripper series. This is episode three, The London Monster. Now, about a hundred years before Jack the Ripper, there was a serial slasher. Some people believe this is all coincidental, but this is Mind Shock, where we have to examine every possible theory in a logical and comprehensive fashion. And that's why all the Mind Shock listeners are here. So we'll be examining that. We'll be examining connections. We'll be examining the London area law enforcement protocols. We'll be examining the media. We'll be examining all of these things which play very large roles in the Jack the Ripper saga, one of the most infamous serial killers in history, if not the most infamous. And we will be getting to the nitty gritty regarding all the details that nobody else wants to go over. As always, if you enjoy the Mind Shock podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube, youtube.com slash mindshock. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, not suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right, so we touched upon the London monster briefly in episode one. Make sure you check out both episode one and episode two to get all caught up in the Jack the Ripper series. Of course, we are just getting started because there there actually is a surprising amount of information not just known about Jack the Ripper, but about the London monster here in the late 1700s. Now, how much of it is true? How much of it is not true? How much of it is partially accurate? Obviously, we have no way of truly knowing definitively, but we'll do our best. Just going to do a quick recap here from the wiki. The London Monster was the name given to an alleged attacker of women in London between 1788 and 1790. Now, coincidentally, this is exactly 100 years in terms of years. It's not the exact dates, of course, to the Jack the Ripper slangs, the canonical ones in in any case. But it's curious because we're talking about exactly 100 years. So some people believe that Jack the Ripper himself was a total fabrication of the media. Not that people didn't get killed, but the very notion of a serial killer per se and the connections between victims and all the hysteria, etc., was manufactured by the media. That's a very interesting theory. Some people allege that continues to this day. I mean, including all of these infamous serial killers. I mean, the Zodiac Killer, if you haven't checked out the Zodiac Killer podcast series on Mindshock, make sure you check that out. The most definitive podcast on the Zodiac Killer. And so some people believe this is just MO. Now, that doesn't mean people didn't die. That doesn't mean there possibly aren't connections between some of the victims. But just in general, the storyline, the narrative has been manufactured to some extent. Now, did that also happen in the 1780s? with the London Monster. And what are the connections there? So continuing here, the attacker had a signature behavior of picurism, the pricking or stabbings of victims with a knife, pin, or needle. History. The first reports of the monster appeared in 1788. According to the victims, most of them from wealthier families, now that's a a curious difference there between the Jack the Ripper slangs of prostitutes or alleged prostitutes, According to the victims, most of them from wealthier families, a large man had followed them, shouted obscenities, and stabbed them in the buttocks. So this wasn't just a a stealth-like individual. This was someone shouting obscenities before the attacks. Some reports claimed an attacker had knives fastened to his knees. Other accounts reported that he would invite prospective victims to smell a fake nosegay and then stab them in the face with the spike hiding within the flowers. 
The nosegay posy or tussy mussy is a small flower bouquet. In terms of pranking, some people will uh, recognize this from uh, clowns that spray the water out of the fake bouquet. Okay. In all cases, the alleged assailant would escape before help arrived. Some women were found with their clothes cut and others had substantial wounds. In two years, the number of reported victims amounted to more than 50. The press soon named the maniac the monster. Descriptions of the attacker varied greatly. Some men even founded a no monster club and began to wear club pins on their lapels to show that they were not the monster. Now, another curiosity here is the Zodiac killer who demanded people wear pins. Is that some weird play on this situation here in the, seven, the late 1700s in Britain? London, although what's kind of weird though is wouldn't the wouldn't the monster wear a pin to sh or a lapel to show that they're not the monster if they want to stay hidden? <laughs> or did people just not think like that in the 1700s? I don't know. Londoners were outraged when the Bow Street Runners, which uh, that was London's first professional police force, originally numbered six men founded in 1749 failed to capture the man. Philanthropist John Julius Angerstein promised a reward of 100 pounds for capture of the perpetrator. Armed vigilantes began to patrol in the city. Fashionable ladies began to wear copper pans over their petticoats. <laughs> there were false accusations and attacks against suspicious people. Local pickpockets and other criminals used the panic to their advantage. They picked someone's valuables, pointed at him, shouted monster and escaped during the resulting mayhem i can imagine uh female pickpockets would uh would have quite the field day with that <laughs> the arrest of reinwick williams what a name i don't think too many people are named reinwick these days on june 13th 1790 ann porter claimed she had spotted her attacker in saint james park her lover john coleman began a slow pursuit of the man a slow pursuit who realized he was being followed. When Reinwick Williams, a 23-year-old florist, reached his house, Coleman confronted him, accusing him of insulting a lady and challenged him to a duel. He eventually took Williams to meet Porter, who fainted when she saw him. Williams protested his innocence, but given the climate of panic, it was futile. He admitted that he had once approached Porter, but had an alibi for another of the attacks. Magistrates charged Williams with defacing clothing, a crime that in the bloody code carried a harsher penalty than assault or attempted murder. Wow. I mean, what kind of a clown reality is this? So basically, you can actually assault somebody. You can try to kill them, even if you fail, but defacing clothing is a far harsher crime. Wow. During the trial, spectators cheered the witnesses for the prosecution and insulted those for the defense. Wow. One of the claimed victims confessed that she had not been attacked at all. Huh. The court granted Williams a retrial. In the new trial, Williams' defense lawyer was Irish poet Theophilus Swift. Theophilus Swift. Another interesting name there. Whose tactic was to accuse Porter of a scheme to collect the reward, Porter having married Coleman, who had received the reward money. Despite the fact that a number of alleged victims gave contradictory stories and that his employers, that his employer and co-workers testified that he had an alibi for the most infamous attack, Williams was convicted on three counts and sentenced to two years each for a total of six years in prison. He was released in December 1796. Historians have speculated whether Williams was the culprit and even questioned whether the London monster existed at all. Reports of monster-like attacks continued to be reported for many years, although they lessened somewhat while Williams was imprisoned. Due to the likelihood that several attackers emulated the original attacker, the London monster is regarded as possibly one of the first copycat cases. It has also been compared to Jack the Ripper, who murdered several prostitutes in London a century later and also received a similar media coverage and press sensationalism. Here's the thing, though. If, let's say, one primary attacker was going around, whatever, stabbed 
some uh, some victims, maybe 10, maybe 20. Other, other psychopaths who want to get on the action, they may also start to do this. Not even necessarily as a copycat, but if it's an itch they wanted to scratch or stab, per se. They decided to do it. Then as soon as this guy's arrested for it, that's them getting let off the hook. Why would they continue the attacks? Unless, you know, obviously a couple of crazies and the true original perpetrator, if it was not Ryan Wick Williams, who, if... How how well off was Ryan Wick Williams? Because is it possible he paid off his employer, he paid off everybody to give him an alibi, or are they all being honest and he really wasn't? So he went up to talk to her one time, but he he admitted that he never admitted to actually stabbing anybody, which is interesting. Here's a more detailed write up for the Strand magazine, strandmag.com, the London Monster. This was posted June 11, 2020, fairly recent write-up by Jan Bondison and Dennis Moore. The London Monster. In 1790, nearly a century before Jack the Ripper haunted the streets of London, another perpetrator held sway. The London Monster, as the mysterious miscreant was soon dubbed, used to walk up to a beautiful, well-dressed lady, insult her with coarse and earthly language, and then stab her in the thigh or buttocks. He struck at regular intervals, wounding a number of young and attractive women in the London streets. In a sextopal event on January 19th, his tally was not less than six victims. Since this kind of sadistic behavior was unheard of at the time, there was general outrage among the Londoners and the capital's female world was in turmoil. Throughout the first half of 1790, the newspapers were full of the London monster's latest outrages. Long defunct papers like The World, The Argus, and The Diary did much to emphasize the sense of an elusive outside threat and the need for vigilante action. The police was roundly criticized for their failure to capture the London monster, and it was even hinted that they were deliberately sheltering the culprit, a gentleman of wealth. And that, of course, is something that gets repeated for the Jack the Ripper theories, which we'll get to. In April... In early April, a £100 reward was posted for the capture of the London Monster by the Lloyd's insurance broker, John Julius Angerstein. Large posters were pasted up all over London to announce that a bloodthirsty, inhuman monster was on the prowl, attacking young and beautiful women in the streets. These posters accomplished what the newspapers had started, namely to create a veritable mass hysteria. Both the police and various amateur monster hunters were out in force. Innocent men were beaten up by the mob after being pointed out as the monster by mischievous people, and the fashionable ladies did not dare venture out into the streets without wearing copper petticoats or other forms of protective clothing. Couldn't they have just carried a gun? The London monster attacks continued throughout April and May, although it was notable that the descriptions of the culprit varied greatly with regard to height, dress, complexion, and hair color. The monster hunter suspected that the fiend was wearing several coats, one on top of each other, and that he made use of a collection of wigs and false noses to disguise his appearance. Mr. Angerson disagreed, pointing out that there was good reason to suspect that more than one of these wretches were infesting the streets. Some ladies faked monster attacks to gain sympathy and compassion. His propensity to, to attack only young and beautiful ladies made it highly fashionable to pose as one of his swooning, tearful victims, basking in the newspaper publicity and receiving visits from manly, muscular monster hunters eager to obtain a description of the mystery assailant. At this stage, some newspaper journalists, aghast at the monster they had helped to create, suggested that the attacks might be the handiwork of some inept pickpockets who were aiming to cut open the ladies' skirt pockets but stab the flesh instead. Such calls for moderation were lost in the general hubbub. It was instead speculated that the monster was a master of disguise, an insane nobleman meant on maiming every beautiful woman in London, or even a supernatural being who could make himself invisible to evade detection. The tally of victims soon reached 50. Some were cut with a sharp object, others kicked from behind with spikes fastened to the monster's knees, and some stabbed in the nose with a stiletto hidden in a nosegay that they were invited to smell at by the elusive fiend. I mean, okay, after the first time that happened, who would be going around smelling nosegays when they know that they're, they're gonna, they could be stabbed in the nose with it? I mean, this is all very weird. 
Finally, on June 13, a suspect was arrested by the vigilante John Coleman after he had been pointed out in Green Park by Ann Porter, coincidentally who ended up marrying John Coleman, a young lady who had been attacked by the London monster in January the same year in front of Perro's Bagnio, the family home at 63 St. James Street. He was the 23-year-old Welshman, Reinwick Williams, a native of Bigildi in the county of Radnor. The son of a respectable apothecary, he had become a ballet dancer, but was sacked from the theater after being suspected of theft. Uh-oh, we might have a criminal history here, although we don't know if he was guilty or innocent of that theft. The young Welshman then sank low in the London underworld supporting himself by various odd jobs. For a few months, he worked as an artificial flower maker at a factory owned by the seedy Frenchman Aimable Michel. But by early 1790, he was unemployed and out in the street again. Huh. So this guy happened to work where uh, nosegays were created. Interesting. But, okay. He lived at a dis disreputable public house where four men shared two beds in a tiny room that the london monster actually slept in the same bed as another man was considered highly significant to explain his bloodthirsty crusade against the female sex when williams was questioned at bow street the police only with difficulty prevented the mob from lynching him and porter the monster victim who had pointed out williams in green park was certain he was the man who had cut her she was seconded by her three sisters, all of whom testified that the Welshman had been in the habit of stalking them in the streets, making use of the most horrid and insulting language. Several other London monster crime victims could not pick Williams out. However, they declared themselves certain he was not the man who had cut them. In the meantime, the judges were contemplating for what crime Williams would be prosecuted. At this time, crimes were either felonies or misdemeanors. The former were serious offenses punishable by death or transportation to the Australian penal colonies. <laughs> misdemeanors were relatively milder offenses punishable by prison, pillory, or a public flogging. To cut or stab some person with an intent to maim or kill them was a misdemeanor, and the judges were uneasily aware that the general mood in London demanded that the monster should be punished severely. They found an ancient statute from the time of George I, intended to prevent weavers from destroying imported foreign clothes, saying that it was a felony to maliciously spoil and destroy any person's garments. Reinwick Williams was tried at the Old Bailey and convicted for destroying the clothes of Ann Porter on January 19th in spite of an alibi provided by his fellow workers at the flower factory. The judge, Sir Francis Buller, Buller, or is it Bueller, <laughs> nevertheless found the stretching of the law to make the monster's crimes a felony somewhat questionable had he not cut the clothes to make way to the flesh underneath. The matter was referred to the 12 judges of England who decided that Ryan McWilliams should be tried again this time for a misdemeanor. Although energetically defended by the eccentric Irish poet Theophilus Swift, who bullied Ann Porter and the other female witnesses mercilessly, the young Welshman was again convicted and sentenced to six years in Newgate. The Is it Newgate Prison called Newgate because they had a new gate? The trial served as a ceremony of exorcism. There were no more attacks, and the London and London had been cleansed of its monster. At the time, many people saw it as an anomaly that Williams was not hanged, flogged within inches of his life, or at least transported to Australia. After all, it was punishable by death to steal a sheep or to pickpocket more than a shilling. Huh, interesting. Today, one is instead concerned that there may have well have been a miscarriage of justice and that Williams was just a scapegoat who had to play the role of the London monster in these two farcical trials. Many of the victims had given descriptions of the mystery assailant that did not fit Williams at all. And for the attack where the evidence against Williams was considered the strongest, he had seven alibi witnesses stating that he had been hard at work making artificial flowers at the time. The veracity of Ann Porter and her boyfriend, John Coleman, who had caught Williams, was cast into doubt by Theophilus Swift, and it is certain that Coleman got his hands on the London Monster Reward and that they married not long after. There is also evidence that the police deliberately coached at least one monster victim to pick out Williams as the man who had attacked them. It is thus quite probable that the Welshman was just a scapegoat, unlucky enough to fall in the hands of the authorities when they needed someone 
to pay for the monster's crimes. The London Monster Mania of 1790 is just one example of what can be called the Phantom Attacker Syndrome. In 1819, Paris was terrorized by piquiers who stabbed women in the behinds with sharp instruments attached to their umbrellas. The French police tried everything, even detectives dressed up in drag, to act as potential victims to find the culprits, but to no avail. In 1938, the Halifax slasher cut a number of people with razor blades. The newspapers were full of the slasher's latest outrages. Vigilantes roamed the streets, and the local women carried lengths of hose pipe filled with lead shot as protection against the slasher. After the local police had declared themselves baffled, Scotland Yard was called in. The experienced detectives found that many slasher victims had faked their own injuries to gain sympathy and recognition just as at least one monster victim had done in 1790. They declared themselves convinced that there had never been a slasher. The whole thing was a typical example of how an urban community could react in an erratic and inexplicable way to an elusive outside threat. These phantom attackers are still with us. In May 2001, speculation was rife in India after a mysterious being had attacked several people in or near New Delhi. The Monkey Man, as he was soon dubbed, climbed the roofs and r savaged people who were sleeping there. He swiftly bounded away if any person tried to grab him. There was speculation whether this threatening sharp-clawed monster was an extraterrestrial, a mutant monkey escaped from a zoo, or a sadistic hoaxer dressed in a gorilla costume. They forgot interdimensional being. There were soon more than 70 victims and a reward of 15,000 rupees was posted for the capture of the monkey man. Armed police patrolled the streets of New Delhi, vigilantes were out in force, and several innocent people were beaten up or lynched after being pointed out as the monkey man. But when the case was properly investigated, it turned out to be yet another episode of mass hysteria. People had faked their injuries and invented sightings of the elusive attacker. Just like the monster mania of 1790, the monkey man scare died out as suddenly as it had begun. See, here's the thing though. Regarding the monkey man and some of these other uh, issues, if there really is a legitimate sh threat, but they only strike a few times, all of these other factors are still in play. I mean, people are, another hoaxer might come forward to, to kind of piggyback the hysteria, People might make up attacks that never happened. That doesn't mean that there weren't some attacks that really happened. Again, th this is uh, another logical fallacy, these false dichotomies. Was there a monster at all back in 1790, or was the entire scare just a case of mass hysteria? No woman was killed or seriously injured by the fiend, and some alleged victims were proved to have faked their injuries. Other purported victims may well have been injured by clumsy pickpockets, as was suggested at the time. Reinwick Williams might have been one of the roughs, habitually insulting women in the London streets, but he was hardly the monster, as judged from the disparity of the descriptions of the prowling miscreant. Unless he was one of several. It is obvious that there were several copycat monsters at large imitating the original attacker. This, in fact, constitutes the earliest known example of copycat crime. The monster mania of 1790 has striking parallels to our own time. An inept police force unable to find its man, a moral entrepreneur creating an urban panic by posting a huge reward, and a press frenzy that generated a climate of fear and a need to convict some person at all costs, even if the evidence was questionable. And we do indeed see this repeat of history. I mean, this happens all the time. Let's go back even further, though, to the old case of Whipping Tom. So Whipping Tom, we, we're going back another century. So we're going to the 1670s now. So again, we do not have exact accuracy here, but it's just curious. Every hundred years, there's some kind of deviant going around slashing or attacking people. It's kind of weird. Now, for those that don't know or are not familiar with Dennis Nilsson, this is arguably one of Britain's worst serial killers. He killed at least 12 young men in northern London between 1978 and 1983. So, the hundred-year curse, so to speak, 
had not has not been broken. So in 2070 or 2080, if London's still around and the world's still around, will there be another slasher of sorts, serial killer or attacker in the London area? But Whipping Tom was the nickname given to two sexual attackers in London and the nearby village of Hackney. Both would attack women walking alone and beat them on their buttocks. While there is some evidence that an earlier attacker in around 1672 was also named Whipping Tom and carried out similar attacks on women, the earliest recorded attacker of this nature was active in central London in 1681. He would approach unaccompanied women in alleys and courtyards and bend them over his knee lift their dress, and spank them on the buttocks before fleeing. The inability of the authorities to apprehend the offender caused complaints about the ineffectiveness of London's constabulary <laughs> and prompted vigilante protocols in the affected areas. I mean, is there a pattern here? A local haberdasher and his accomplice were captured and tried for the attacks. A haberdasher is a business or person who sells small articles for sewing, dressing, and knitting, such as buttons, ribbons, and zips. <laughs> a second attacker, nicknamed Whipping Tom, was active in late 1712 in Hackney, then a rural village outside London. This attacker would approach lone women in the countryside and beat them on their buttocks with a birch rod. Around 70 attacks were carried out before a local man named Thomas Wallace was captured and confessed to the attacks. See, back in those days, what did they do to gain that confession? Earlier whipping toms, although no record exists of any similar attacks prior to 1681 or of the nickname Whipping Tom existing prior to this date, a publication of 1681 mentions the generation of that Whipping Tom that about nine years since proved such an enemy to the milk wench's bums. <laughs> a milk wench. Implying that a similar attacker with the same nickname had operated in or around 1672. You know, it's weird, though. I mean, the world would be a better place if instead of serial killers actually killing and maiming people, there were just some uh, some deviants of this nature that just slapped people or spanked them or whatever. I mean, obviously, that's not good either. That's assault. But that's a lot better than killing people. And it's, I mean, obviously, a lot of people were killed in the 1600s and 1700s and 1800s as well in the midst of wars and all these other things. But it's just weird. I mean, all of these accounts are just weird. The Whipping Tom of 1681. The Whipping Tom of 1681 was active in the Warren of Small Courtyards between Fleet Street, Strand, and Holborn. He would wait in the narrow and dimly lit alleys and courtyards. After approaching an unaccompanied woman, he would grab her strongly, lift her dress, and slap her buttocks repeatedly with his hand before fleeing. He would sometimes accompany his attacks by shouting, Spanko! He attacked a large number of women, and while he would often use his bare hand, he would occasionally use a rod. Some of his victims were left badly injured by the attacks. He would appear, carry out his attacks, and vanish with such speed that some people attributed him with supernatural powers. You know it would be weird if this was some kind of interdimensional trickster entity who uh, did these attacks in the 1600s, and maybe he was around in the 1570s and 1580s as well, there's just no record of it, and then he just slowly escalated from spanking to stabbing and then eventually Jack the Ripper's case to flat-out killing and eviscerating in... in incredibly demonic fashion or were these just diff different trickster entities was this a family of interdimensional trickster entities some of them more evil than the others some of them more trickster playful type others more prone to serial killing is that the real solution to the jack the ripper quagmire there was a great public outcry in response to the attacks, which prompted complaints about the ineffectiveness of London's policing arrangements at the time. Women would carry pen knives, sharp bodkins, scissors, and the like, and male vigilantes would dress in women's clothing and patrol the areas he was known to operate. It's just the origin of drag. 
to catch Whipping Tom in the 1600s. A haberdasher from Halborn and his accomplice were captured in late 1681 and tried for the attacks, although no record now exists of the trials or of their identities. In 1681, Whipping Tom brought to light and exposed to view an anonymously written book about the attacks was released. Huh. The Whipping Tom of 1712, between October 10th and December 1st, 1712, a string of further attacks took place in fields near Hackney. This attacker, also nicknamed Whipping Tom, would approach lone women and beat them with a great rod of birch. Around 70 women were assaulted before a local man named Thomas Wallace was captured and confessed to the attacks. According to Wallace, he was, quote, resolved to be revenged on all the women he could come at after that manner for the sake of one perjured female who had barbarously false to him, who had been barbarously false to him, end quote. He claimed that his plan was to attack a hundred women before Christmas, cease the attacks during the 12 days of Christmas, and then resume the attacks in the new year. Very thoughtful guy here. So basically, apparently, a woman made a false claim against him, a barbarously false claim. Now, it's it's unclear what that claim exactly was, but this was his retaliation for the false claim is to attack all these... Did he even attack the woman who made the false claim? Because that'd be kind of dumb if he didn't, but... I mean, this is all quite curious. Quite curious. Every hundred years, there's some kind of a serial slasher or spanker of some kind. This is weird. This is very, very weird. What's also interesting is in the Whipping Tom accounts, at least one of them supposedly worked with an accomplice. Now, that's curious. That's curious. So if that's the case with the London Monster and Jack the Ripper, is it possible if there's two individuals... I mean, this almost reminds me of the movie Scream, for those who haven't seen the, uh, the pretty famous Wes Craven movie Scream from 1996... Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if people haven't seen that movie, but uh, I'm not going to say anything about it other than it's a lot easier to get away with murder when there's more than one person doing the murder because you technically could have an alibi and swap as necessary. Is that what happened in the Whipping Tom case? The other thing that's kind of curious is that these Whipping Tom attacks spanned roughly three decades. You know, there were these three waves, so to speak. So if, I mean, with with at least two individuals involved, so more likely three, four, five, or plus more, it, it's just really weird. And then also, again, we have these century repeats, so to speak. Is that all coincidental? Also, the way that copycats work, because technically Whipping Tom might have been the first copycat and not the London Monster because you have the all these different attacks and then it happens again in 1712, random time period. But would it have happened if the media hadn't focused on it before? And that's an interesting conundrum too because if all of this, I don't want to say glorifying, because I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I would say serial killers are glorified in a certain extent. They are celebritized in a certain extent, but would that deter? So obviously, let's not fall for these false economy logic fallacies. Obviously, some people are still going to do whatever they're going to do, because otherwise, you know, otherwise laws would actually work. I mean, there's laws against murder and theft and assault. That doesn't seem to really stop many people because there's people killing people every single day, assaulting every day, and thieving every day. But a curious question is what percentage would be deterred by simply not knowing about it? So with serial killers too, it's not that people don't know that there are serial killers, but when you're constantly bringing this attention to people, it's constantly in the sphere of consciousness. Does that bring about more attackers? And that's, that's kind of the main question here that I'm going to leave everybody with. I did want to just touch upon this because we're going to be referencing some things in terms of media coverage in the Jack the Ripper case in the following episodes that are, that it, I think it's, 
I don't want to say coincidental per se. I don't want to say critically important per se. But I think it's it's uh, it would be foolish not to keep in mind the history of London and these century-based attacks and possibly a paranormal or supernatural connection. Time travelers, interdimensional entities, things of that nature. We keep it all on the table on Mindshock because the truth is not afraid of investigation. And the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mindshock podcast in the Jack the Ripper case series. If you enjoy the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Help us get more mind-shocking content out there in a variety of cases and topics. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic logical analysis, co podcast to request. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.